business news, JMMB's Vertex partners with the DBJ to fund SMEs. Regionally in Barbados, climate damage to result in 100 million people being pushed into poverty. On the international scene, Mexico's president seeks help from China to stop fentanyl imports. In sports news, boxing champion Takima Mulling states his intention to bring the sport back to its fullest. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I am Maya Chung. Court statistician with the Court Statistics Unit of the Court Administration Division CAD Dr. Donato Dennis says the 20 to 30 percent annual rate of clearing court matters is a main contributor to the crushing backlog of cases within the Jamaican legal system that the nation is now contending with. He said that the Civil Division of the Supreme Court has traditionally had a very low clearance rate and this means if you're doing that long enough over time, you build up a substantial backlog, which is the case for the High Court Civil Division that there is still a substantial backlog. But what we would have seen in 2022 in particular is that um, a number of up projects um, and operational reform initiatives were pursued by the Chief Justice um, and, and the, the, the team which have resulted in a targeted approach to dealing with um, backlogged cases, both active and inactive backlogged cases. And so the giant leap that the Chief Justice would have mentioned in the clearance rate of about 52 percentage points gain, which is um, on, on record, that's the highest clearance rate that the Civil Division of the Supreme Court would have recorded, on record, uh, which is a 78%. Um, so, so it's a result of structural reforms. The two years that is used to classify a case as being in backlog is guided by international standards. He added that the current processes used in this paradigm do not lend themselves to efficient disposal. Reforms that are being pursued, which the Chief Justice would have mentioned, um, are necessary um, to reduce the time between, the interval time between events along the case law continuum and so one of the next steps um, needs to be for the civil division to set uh, what we call intermediate time standards so we have the two years as the global standard we need to dispose of a case within two years currently we're taking between four and five years on average to dispose of a civil case closer to five years more so um, it needs to be down to two so what, what needs to happen is that we need to set intermediate time standards, which means between each major event on the case flow continuum, there needs to be precise time standards defined towards attaining the two-year mark. Um, in terms of a projection, the Chief Justice would have given an indication of the possibility of accomplishing this um, within the next 18 months, two years. I think that is... Um, it's doable with a lot of um, hard work and, a per and persisting with the structural, deep structural reforms. Dr. Dennis was speaking recently at the third staging of a conversation with the judiciary put on by the Court Administration Division CAD, which sought to update members of the public through the media. This is about the improvements and developments within the Jamaican judiciary system that are being carried out to improve the dispensation of justice in Jamaica. And it is now time for the Business Report with Danita Rodney. Motorists will see an increase at the pumps in the price of gasoline and a decrease in the price of diesel effective Thursday, April 6, according to the latest ex-refinery costs from Petrojam. 90-octane gasoline will sell for $174.25 per litre, up by $1.95, while 87-octane will sell for $170.17 per litre, up by $2.35. Down by $4.50, automotive diesel fuel will sell for $187.37 per litre. Ultra-low sulfur diesel will sell for $198.22 per litre. And kerosene will sell for $198.42 per litre. 
Propane liquid petroleum will sell for $65.89 per liter, up by 25 cents, and butane liquid petroleum will sell for $72.84 per liter after an increase of $1.08. Remember that marketing companies and retailers will add their respective markups to the announced prices. JMMB Securities Limited, through its private equity solution, Vertex SME Holdings, recently secured additional funding from the Development Bank of Jamaica, DBJ, that will help to strengthen access to financing for small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs. According to reports, through this partnership, the private equity outfit is looking to add more investors that will help it to fund companies having high growth potential across various industries locally and in the wider Caribbean. Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for Wednesday, April 5, the US dollar sold for an average of $152.68. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $114.39, the pound sterling traded for $189.31, and the euro sold for an average of $169.73. In GSE trading, the GSE index declined by 1,159 points, the junior market index declined by 8 points, the combined market index declined by 1,154 points, and the All Jamaican Composite Index declined by 2,088 points. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 105 stocks of which 40 advanced, 47 declined, and 18 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited Variable Preference, Access Financial Services Limited, and Barita Investments Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, and Barita Investments Limited. Trading firm were Blue Power Group Limited, Edufocal Limited, and Fosterage Company Limited. The overall volume leaders were Access Financial Services Limited with over 67 million units, Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with over 4 million units and JMMB Group Limited 7.50% with over 2 million units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, Zero Securities traded. Zero Securities were traded on the Barbados Stock Exchange. In regional business, Guyana's growth outlook remains favorable over the next few years, largely on account of the country's oil and gas sector. But World Bank's economist William Maloney advised the country to continue bolstering the institutions tasked with managing oil wealth. More from Newsroom Guyana. You don't get 25% rate of growth uh, without having something like discovering oil. Um, so clearly the oil and gas sector is driving those high rates of growth. And the big challenge will be to develop an institutional structure that ensures that those resources go where they have to go. Um, that are used constructively for um, laying the foundations for new industries to, to diversify the economy, to deal with, uh, to address long-standing social needs, and just to maintain, to have a, a government framework that ensures that these resources are used well. Uh, I would say that's the big challenge, and I think that is where the World Bank is actually involved in Guyana right now. The region has done relatively poorly compared with the rest of the world in terms of recovering from the pre-pandemic, uh, being the region that has grown least since 2019. That varies pretty significantly across sub-regions. You see that South America has uh, returned to trend more or less and is almost at the trend line it was at before. Central America uh, is not recovering its previous uh, levels of growth. And the Caribbean has not recovered trend yet either. And that's largely due to falls in the lack of recovery of tourism. The forecasts going forward are less optimistic than in previous years. We're expecting 1.4% growth this year, going to 2.4% and 2.4% in 2024, 2025. Um, the reasons for this are, are in the short run, that we're facing stronger headwinds in the global economy and reduced tailwinds. The first most important thing is that growth in the advanced countries is slowing down, 
partly as a result of the higher interest rates and fighting inflation, partly as a result of the war in, uh, in Ukraine. China's growth is now recovering after the lifting of COVID um, lockdown, of the COVID lockdown, but uh, its growth will be uncertain over the near future. Commodity prices are expected to fall, and as we know, numerous countries in the region are very dependent on that. And interest rates, the fourth factor, are expected to remain high until inflation is, is brought under control. All those things in the short run are implying that um, growth will be slow in the region for this year. In international business, the S&P 500 dipped and the Nasdaq ended sharply on Wednesday. More in this report. U.S. stocks ended mostly lower on Wednesday after a wave of weak economic data deepened worries that the Federal Reserve's rapid interest rate hikes might tip the economy into a recession. The Dow gained a quarter percent, while the S&P 500 dropped a quarter percent and the Nasdaq shed more than a percent. Driving the recession fears, the ADP National Employment Report showed U.S. private employers hired far fewer workers than expected in March. That followed Tuesday's weak job openings data. In recent months, bad news has been good news for investors who cheered weak economic data on the belief it might mean the Fed's interest rate hikes to tame inflation were working and that the central bank could ease up on its campaign. But that dynamic appears to be shifting, says Philip Palumbo, CEO and chief investment officer of Palumbo Wealth Management. So we saw in the first quarter is just the, the, the quantity and the amount percentage wise that the 10 year went down is almost the exact amount that the S&P 500 and NASDAQ went up. So it was more of a function of rates going down than necessarily fundamentals, which is really going to be front and center for 2023 and going to be the reason why we either retest where we saw last year, or even go lower than that. Chip maker NVIDIA dropped more than 2% after Google said the supercomputers it uses to train its artificial intelligence models were faster and more power efficient than comparable components made by NVIDIA. Tesla fell more than 3.5%, while Amazon and Apple each declined more than 1%, pulling down the Nasdaq and reversing gains in some of Wall Street's most valuable companies in recent weeks. In market data for oil, oil rose and was on track for a third weekly gain as further production cuts targeted by OPEC Plus and a drop in U.S. oil inventories overshadowed fears over global economic growth. Brent crude rose 31 cents to $85.30 a barrel, and West Texas Intermediate crude advanced 32 cents to $80.93. And that was the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. In regional news, Barbados is warning that 100 million people will be pushed into poverty as a result of climate damage. Special envoy on the climate to the Prime Minister, Professor Avinash Prasad, while issuing the stark warning, spoke about a support mechanism for natural disaster-hit countries. Where there are revenue streams attached, we need to involve the private sector. Where there are savings, we need to shift the multilateral development banks so they are playing a much greater role, where we are doubling and trebling at the amount that they lend. We're releasing a trillion dollars extra. This is possible. The G20 Working Party highlighted the fact that we need to employ callable capital, SDRs, and if we do so effectively, make callable capital callable, we can create that headroom. And that headroom needs to be focused on those investments and adaptation and resilience for which they are not revenue streams attached, but they are savings to be had. Where people can see directly the benefits and interests to all, where all are contributing and all are benefiting. And I think uniquely that space in which that occurs is in climate change. I think in climate change we are seeing the real development of a global coalition for change. And climate change has all of the issues of justice, inequality, and need for global action. 
In Antigua, Foreign Affairs Minister E.P. Chet Green is reaffirming the government's plan to push for travel and tourism opportunities between the Caribbean and Africa. The minister says he is both hurt and angry at recent reactions to the West African migrant issue. Ursul Charles Jr. reports. Establishing linkages between the Caribbean region and the African continent is part of an overall plan. That's according to Foreign Affairs Minister the Honorable E.P. Chet Green. He says the overarching plan, though, is much larger than just this country. We were trying and still have a vision of, uh, of developing tourism, a vibrant trade, travel trade included, between Africa and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Antigua is only one stop in that Caribbean um, destination. Mm -hmm. Local spotlight on last Tuesday's migrant boat tragedy has renewed focus on migratory patterns, but the minister says migration is but a normal global phenomenon. The discussion globally now is that people are going to migrate for different reasons, other than economy. They might, you might put it back down to economy in the, in the end, or economics in the end, because things like climate change will force persons yes, to move, mm -hmm, albeit mm -hmm, temporarily. Mm -hmm. So when you have persons who depend on farming, for example, and climate change affects them so, so adversely that they can't eco the living for themselves and their families, they are going to move. Green says the politicizing of the issue by many has been disappointing. Unfortunately, unfortunately, like so many things in the country, it became politicized. It bothers me. It angers me. It hurts me. It troubles me. Because I see Africans as not just people, but as special people. Mm -hmm. We are quintessentially, predominantly, of African stock. Mm -hmm. And so how can you tell me that we embrace every other race and culture? But when ours arrive, it's a problem. The minister made the comments on the Beneath the Surface radio program on his With the People FM radio station on Tuesday. For ABS News, I am Ursil Charles Jr. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley says drug dealers and gang leaders are replacing the role of the church in the community. That's why he's calling on Anglican Bishop Claude Berkeley to assert the church's presence and encourage parents to take responsibility for their children. To get to this point and officially open his court, both the government and the Anglican Church have equally contributed to its restoration. According to what you have, we can try to match you, and working together, we can get this job done. We appeal to the Prime Minister for help, and he and his team sent an emissary during the COVID it's that kind of teamwork the Prime Minister believes can reform the nation's youth, who he says we are losing significantly. The teaching of the religious bodies would have contributed to that period of what we call the old time days when the kinds of behavior that we see now in our population was not. During the feature address, Dr. Rowley explained that religion taught young people the difference between what's right and wrong and discernment. And without that, he believes their behavior has deteriorated. It's why he's challenging Anakon Bishop Reverend Claude Berkeley to call on his colleagues to assume a greater responsibility in the national community and to encourage parents to stand responsibility for their children. And not just raise them and let them loose on the national community and hope that the teacher succeeds or worse, that the police succeeds. Because too many instances of the drug dealer, the gang leader, or the ne'er-do-well succeeding in replacing what the churches used to do. It's a challenge Bishop Berkeley welcomes, noting that prayer can change attitudes and influence actions. You pray and do as much as you can, and God will do the rest for us. Bishop Berkeley said he plans to resume having parish members speak with the community. He said they also formed a task force which reviewed the over 50 Anakin primary schools and they are now implementing the recommendations. Dr. Rowley went to one of those schools, the Mason Hall Anakin Primary School, and even made fun of his cabinet members, Com Imbert, Stuart Young, and Simon De Nobrega, who didn't. 
These gentlemen, all disappointed that they never got to a real school. His court was built in 1910. Traditionally, it was used as the residence of Anakon bishops to Trinidad. Bishop Berkeley resides somewhere else, but said the newly restored building that cost approximately $6 million will be used otherwise. Carissa Lee, CNC3 News. And in news on the international scene, Mexico's president has written to the Chinese president urging him to help control shipments of fentanyl. The U.S. has criticized Mexico, saying it is not doing enough to stop the trafficking of the synthetic opioid. Al Jazeera's John Holman has more. It's been a red button issue in the U.S. for the last few years. Fentanyl, a synthetic opioid up to 50 times stronger than heroin with the overdose rate to match. And some Republican lawmakers have been ratcheting up the pressure on Mexico to stop it getting into the states, led by Senator Lindsey Graham. Fentanyl is a killer, and the people killing Americans reside out in the open in Mexico. We're going to designate these groups. He's trying to introduce legislation to designate Mexican cartels as international terrorist organizations and potentially authorize the U.S. military to head into the country to stop them. And Mexico is not happy. These proposals are in themselves a lack of respect and a threat to our sovereignty. President López Obrador was speaking in his Tuesday morning press conference. He wasn't addressing the U.S., but actually reading aloud from a letter he just sent to the president of China. Why? Because some fentanyl comes from China into Mexican ports, either as separate ingredients already fully produced, and is then processed and smuggled into the U.S. López Obrador's letter asks his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping for help in stopping that. But only after several paragraphs of denouncing the demands of the U.S. politicians. It's just the latest act in what's been largely political theatre. Senator Graham's proposal to send U.S. troops into Mexico was never going to get off the ground. Likewise, President Xi Jinping of China is highly unlikely to intervene and stop fentanyl precursors from getting into Mexico. But it does give everyone the chance to beat their drum just before election season. Meanwhile, there is a real problem. Mexican cartels are doing big business with fentanyl, and the U.S. government is talking with Mexico about how to stop them. The problem is that you can't stop one drug on its own without reforming a whole law and order system, says security analyst Falco Ernst. Um, to actually make a dent in a criminal group's um, capacity to operate in Mexico, you would have to fix very deeply rooted problems. And that includes getting corruption and collusion out of the judicial and the policing system and also of the, uh, out of the armed forces. Um, so there simply is no such thing as a magic bullet to solve the situation. So the outcome of all the talk? Likely some saber rattling until the political expediency is gone. Meanwhile, the laws of supply and demand keep the river of drugs running from Mexico into the U.S. John Holman, Al Jazeera, Mexico City. In sports news, the focus is on boxing. Boxing for Sakima Mullings in an exclusive interview with the PBCJ Sports News team is stating his intention to rebuild the support, enthusiasm and success of the sport as the boxer and coach faces his last year of his master's degree in sports management. His studies are being done at the University of the West Indies and they end this year. In the first of this two-part feature, we hear from boxing great Sakima Mullings. In expressing his enthusiasm to see the glory days of the boxing triumphs and successes of the 80s in Jamaica return and be surpassed, the 2011 Commonwealth Zonal Middleweight Champion, 2013 Caribbean Boxing Federation WBC Welterweight Champion, the 2014 Rian Nephew Contender Champion and 2017 Contender Champion had this to say to the PBCJ Sports News team. The way that boxing is organized and structured in Jamaica, there, 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 there's not enough happening. And um, the idea is, is that if there was more happening and also 
you know, if there was maybe a, a, a grassroots program, an intermediate program, and, um, and an elite level program, so that you could um, create a pathway for the average um, Jamaican youth that you would recruit into boxing, so that he sees a way where, in terms of just like the, the progression that he has to make in terms of becoming a successful amateur, and then if he would like to turning into a professional fighter. His intention is to bring the sport back and take it to levels it has never reached, intertwined with his own future and career in the area of boxing. He told our sports news team that his future in the sport is broad and eclectic. I believe that there are a lot of the functional areas in boxing that are dormant right now and need a lot of attention in regards to um, developing fighters in regards to promoting fighters, in regards to managing fighters, in regards to um, advising fighters, in regards to having the appropriate um, equipment, in regards to having the appropriate um, infrastructure, in regards to having platforms where fighters can um, reach out to the public and let them know what's going on with them, where, where they, they can see them fight, where they can be humanized in terms of understanding that um, the fighters have um, lives outside of boxing. So I believe that those facets and just um, a lot of other functional areas are missing from boxing. So it, it's just to organize those things and to create a whole boxing ecosystem where if um, a young Jamaican wants to get involved in boxing, there becomes um, structure, there becomes an organization, there becomes um, a pathway for them to participate in boxing and then to have a future in boxing if they choose to do so. In an interview at the Stanley Couch Gym in downtown Kingston on Wednesday, Mulling said how he has envisioned his plans will take shape. Again, as I transitioned from boxing in terms of being an athlete and how I wanted to stay involved in the sport, I chose to further my um, education at the University of the West Indies where I'm studying um, sport. I'm getting an MSc in sports business management. I believe that my certification will allow me to approach boxing from a management standpoint in terms of providing the, the managerial needs that a boxer needs to navigate their career and also how to navigate um, becoming attractive, becoming um, marketable to corporate Jamaica and also in, in terms of advising a fighter in the business aspects of their career and also the functional aspects of their careers like what they should be doing at this point in their career how they should be approaching certain aspects of their um, career it also it's a sports business management degree so it also allows me to put the other business elements in place that will allow me to facilitate these things um, for a fighter so that again they just don't look at boxing as a um, as a sport but they also look at the, the sport of boxing in terms of the business of boxing and the ecosystem that revolves around them as the, um, as the fighter. Sakima indicated that there will be a high level of autonomy in his work towards helping with the resurrection of the boxing sport in his home country of Jamaica. In his opinion, there are many reasons the sport has fallen and can't get up, like overall neglect from the various official bodies needed to see boxing thrive coupled with COVID-19. Again, you know, in the beginning, it's, it, it, it's going to take a lot of hard work from Sakiba Mullins. And autonomy is very important um, to me in, in terms of moving my vision forward in Jamaica boxing. So within that, it's that if the requisite organizations want to come on board and they want to contribute and they want to help, we welcome it. But then it's also about remaining, um, I think that boxing is a very nuanced sport. And it takes a certain um, understanding of how boxing operates as a business to, to move the sport forward. And in maintaining that autonomy, it's to, um, it, it, it's to produce a quality product. It's to first produce a quality product. And then within that quality product, if other, the other organizations see value in that and they want to come on board, we'll be welcome for them to come on board in terms of whatever they're able to contribute in moving Jamaica boxing forward. And that's the news on PBCJ. I am Maya Chung. Remember to rejoin us for news on this station on Tuesday, April 11, 2023. You can follow us on our social media platforms at PBC Jamaica. Thank you for watching. <laughs>